SpaceX and U.S. telecommunications company T-Mobile have outlined plans to connect users' mobile phones directly to satellites in orbit. The announcement was made at a flashy event at SpaceX's South Texas Starship factory, also known as Starbase. Let's hear the major takeaways of the event. This is a technology partnership about dedicating T-Mobile's, a slice of T-Mobile's mid-band PCS spectrum to be integrated into Starlink satellites launched next year. You can connect with your existing phone. It's a lot like putting a cellular tower in the sky. We will enter beta as soon as late next year with messaging, MMS, and even messaging apps. We're going to go after data, we're going to go after voice, and we're going to connect people all across this country. We expect on our most popular plans for this service to be included for free. Uh, now, this, this, this won't have the kind of bandwidth that a Starlink terminal would have, but it, it will enable texting, it, it will enable uh, images, and if, you're, if, you're, if there aren't too many people in, this, in the cell zone, you could even potentially have a little bit of video. So the, the important thing about this is that it, it means there's no dead zones anywhere in the world for your cell phone. Um, well, you, you don't need to sort of point it at the sky and like follow the satellite or anything like that. I think even in your pocket and your, in your car, it, it'll, it'll work uh, well. And, and we're, we think probably uh, up to two to four megabits per cell zone. So that's uh, you know th thousands of, of uh, voice calls and um, you know millions of, of text messages. The the, uh, the the way we're doing this is with uh, really quite quite big antennas. So, the, you know, so people might be wondering what technology is necessary to make this work. Um, and uh, in order to make this work, you actually have to have big antennas on, on the satellites and, and powerful antennas. And you need a, you need a lot of satellites. Um, and, but that's, that's kind of what we have with the uh, Starlink uh, Gen 2 satellites. The antennas have to be extremely advanced because they've got to pick up a very quiet signal from your cell phone. And you can imagine if that's like cell phone, that, that, that signal's got to travel 500 miles and then be caught by a satellite that's traveling 17,000 miles an hour. Um, and the satellite's got to compensate for the Doppler effect of, of moving so fast. So it's, it's, this is really quite a difficult technical challenge. Um, but we have it working in the lab, and, and we're, we're confident this will uh, work in the field. This is really meant to provide uh, basic coverage to areas that are currently completely dead. Even if an entire region or country was, was uh, lost connectivity because of a severe, you know, uh, hurricane or floods or fires or you know, tornadoes, uh, earthquakes. There's so many natural disasters, obviously. Um, you would actually still have, even if all the cell towers were taken out, your phone would still work. Um, so uh, the thing that I think is really profound about what we're announcing today is that it will save lives. Um, and we will no longer read about these tragedies that, that happened where people got lost. And, and if only they could have called for help, they'd be OK. And, but we, but we, we, want to, we do want to work with uh, uh, other partners in, in, in other parts of the world and, and really enable this as a, a function anywhere. According to a press release from T-Mobile, the satellite to cellular service will be available everywhere in the continental U.S., Hawaii, parts of Alaska, Puerto Rico and territorial waters. According to Musk, the service will be added to Tesla vehicles to allow drivers to make emergency calls and texts. SpaceX appears to have changed plans for the deployment of the second-generation Starlink satellites. In a recent letter to the U.S. Federal Communications Commission, SpaceX told that it intends to launch downsized Starlink V2 satellites on Falcon 9 rockets to hasten the Constellation's deployment. Initially, SpaceX planned to place the second-generation Starlink satellites into orbit using the company's two-stage Starship launch vehicle. SpaceX is still aiming to embark on a full-scale orbital test flight with Starship sometime later this year. In the meantime, the company tells the FCC that it can start launching downsized second-gen satellites using existing Falcon 9 rockets. The, the Starlink uh, V2 satellites are, are very large and, uh, and too big to fit in a Falcon 9. Uh, but the, uh, we, are, we are actually looking at, at an interim uh, solution, which is like a, a sort of Starlink V2 mini that would um, maybe launch uh, if, if, a Starlink, if the Starship is program uh, is delayed uh, longer than expected, we'd, launch a sort of a, small, a smaller uh, Starlink V2 kind of mini that would fit on a Falcon 9. 
Starship is capable of carrying up to 400 satellites per launch, a significant increase from the 60 satellites that a standard Falcon 9 rocket can carry into space. The Gen 2 Starlink satellites are 7 meters long and weigh 1,250 kilograms. The usable length of the payload fairing of Falcon 9 rockets is 6.7 meters, so with minor tweaks, SpaceX can fit the Gen 2 satellites vertically inside Falcon 9 for launch. SpaceX claims that although the satellites launched on Falcon 9 won't be as powerful as those launched on Starship, they will still offer the same performance as those launched on Starship. In its letter to the FCC, SpaceX did not specify when it could start launching the second-generation constellation. But the company said that whether launched on Falcon 9 or Starship, it is planning to deploy nearly 30,000 Gen 2 satellites across nine orbits of altitudes between 340 and 614 kilometers. SpaceX's uncrewed Dragon cargo spacecraft returned to Earth with an ocean splashdown off the coast of Florida on August 20, marking the end of the company's 25th cargo resupply mission to the International Space Station. SpaceX launched the CRS-25 mission on July 15, with the spacecraft arriving at the station two days later. It delivered nearly 2,630 kilograms of science experiments, crew supplies, and other cargo to the station. A month later, on August 19, the spacecraft undocked from the space station, setting up its return to Earth with more than 1,800 kilograms of valuable scientific experiments and other cargo. The spacecraft brought home a spacesuit worn by European astronaut Matthias Mohrer during a spacewalk in March. After the spacewalk was successfully completed, crew members on board the ISS noticed water leaking in the spacesuit's helmet. NASA then suspended the use of U.S. spacesuits for non-emergency spacewalks until the suit was brought back to Earth for inspection and analysis. Along with the spacesuit, the spacecraft also carried myriad experiments from the station, allowing researchers to continue data collection and analysis on the ground. Please check the link in the description for the list of scientific hardware and samples returned to Earth by the Cargo Dragon spacecraft. NASA's James Webb Space Telescope has detected carbon dioxide on an alien world for the first time. On August 25, a group of more than 30 scientists studying the transmission spectrum of the exoplanet WASP-39b reported finding a clear signal of an abundance of carbon dioxide in the planet's atmosphere. WASP-39b is a hot gas giant planet with a diameter 1.3 times greater than Jupiter, orbiting a sun-like star 700 light-years away. The spectrum of WASP-39b was one of the first five web images that were released to the public on July 12. Webb uses its infrared spectrometer to measure the starlight passing through the atmospheres of distant planets like WASP-39b. Because different elements and molecules absorb light at different wavelengths, the resulting pattern of dips and spikes reveals what chemicals are present in the intervening atmosphere. Although water vapor, potassium, and sodium have previously been found in the exoplanet's atmosphere by the Hubble and Spitzer space telescopes, this is the first time carbon dioxide has been clearly identified on a distant world. Understanding the composition of a planet's atmosphere can help researchers learn more about its origin and evolution. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. On Thursday, SpaceX conducted spin-prime tests of Super Heavy Booster 7 and Starship 24 at the Starbase launch site. Let's take a chronological look at the events that happened over the past few days. Following two single outer engine static fire tests two weeks ago, Booster 7 was returned to the production site on August 12 for the installation of the 13 inner engines. After two weeks of engine installation, the prototype was rolled out to the launch site on Tuesday morning. After arriving at the launch site, the vertical stabilizers on the launch tower arms attached to the booster, and the arms gently lifted the rocket off its transport stand and placed it on the orbital launch mount. Three weeks ago, on August 6, SpaceX used a crane to lift the booster due to a hydraulic failure on the tower arms. As the arms were repaired last week, SpaceX was able to lift the booster with the chopsticks on Tuesday. As you can see in this footage from Lab Padre, SpaceX hasn't fully installed the shielding over the outer engines of the booster. This is because SpaceX needs to have direct access to the quick disconnect panels of the outer engines during static fire testing. Please check out my previous video to learn more about these quick disconnect panels, link in the description. On Thursday, August 25th, at 1.25 p.m. local time, SpaceX conducted a spin prime test of Booster 7. A similar spin prime test was again conducted at 2 p.m. Both tests involved one engine from each ring of Raptor engines. At 5.42 p.m. local time, SpaceX spun the engine turbines of Ship 24 with high-pressure gas to test the plumbing. It was Ship 24's eighth spin prime test overall. 
although a six-engine test to round up Ship 24's static fire campaign was anticipated last week, it has yet to occur. At the time of making this video, SpaceX is getting ready to remove Ship 24 from suborbital launch pad B. It looks like SpaceX is planning to stack the ship atop Booster 7, rather than moving it back to the build site. If that's the case, we might see a full-stack cryo-proof test next week. SpaceX has test windows tentatively scheduled from Monday to Wednesday. In addition to readying Booster 7 for its next round of static fire testing, SpaceX has been modifying the orbital launch mount over the past few weeks. It's unclear exactly what the teams were working on, but it seems like SpaceX is trying to fix the problem that caused the explosion on July 11th. Before moving through with plans to fire all 33 Raptor engines of the booster simultaneously, SpaceX must make sure the launch platform is completely ready. We have some updates from NASA regarding the Starship Lunar Human Landing System. Let's quickly summarize the operation of the Starship Lunar Landing System to better understand the recent updates. The Lunar Starship mission starts with the launch of the Fuel Depot Starship into a low Earth orbit. Then there will be a number of propellant aggregation launches to fill up the depot starship with the fuel required for the journey to the lunar surface. This will be followed by the launch of the lunar starship that will go to the moon. After refueling with the depot starship in Earth orbit, the lunar ship will begin its journey toward the moon. The ship will then dock with the Orion capsule or NASA's gateway outpost orbiting the moon. The lunar starship with astronauts transferred from the Orion capsule will then descend to the lunar surface to begin scientific investigations. Later, the ship will return the astronauts to the Orion capsule, which will take them back to Earth. According to NASA, the lunar landing of two NASA astronauts on the Artemis III mission will be preceded by an uncrewed lunar starship test mission planned for 2024. Recently, NASA revealed that SpaceX would only send a skeleton version of its lunar starship to the surface of the Moon during the uncrewed test mission. Moreover, that skeleton version of the lunar starship would only have to land on the lunar surface and it wouldn't have to take off again. The ship will land in the Moon's south polar region, which is where the Artemis III mission will touch down in 2025. The landing site for the demonstration mission has not yet been determined, but a crucial criterion is that the landing site would not disrupt any of Artemis III's possible landing locations. According to NASA, there will be an opportunity to do science on the uncrewed demo landing. That includes flying a suite of sensors, imagers, and potentially one scientific payload to the lunar surface. All this latest information was disclosed by Lisa Watson Morgan, manager of the Human Landing System Program, while she was speaking at the annual meeting of NASA's Lunar Exploration Analysis Group on August 23. According to Watson Morgan, SpaceX has been a fantastic partner on HLS so far, and during the meeting, she revealed the mock-up of the elevator system required to go from the crew cabin of Lunar Starship to the surface of the Moon. She guaranteed that the elevator design is robust, multi-fault tolerant, and suitable for use on the Moon. According to Watson Morgan, NASA's requirements for HLS missions end once the astronauts are returned to Orion, and the fate of the Starship lander after returning astronauts from the lunar surface is up to SpaceX. Now, let's go back to Starbase. You may remember the E-Dome test tank that was delivered to the launch site on June 8. The tank was designed to validate the new flatter propellant tank dome that will be used on future Starship prototypes. The E-Dome tank was transported back to the production site on Thursday without conducting a single structural stress test. Along with the test tank, three self-propelled modular transporters carrying the booster load spreader, lots of ballasts, and some ground support equipment also left the launch site. It appears that SpaceX is cleaning the launch site ahead of the upcoming 33-engine static fire test of Booster 7. Surprisingly, on Thursday, teams rolled out the Super Heavy Booster Test Tank 7.1 from the build site to the launch site. The test tank is designed to test the recent Super Heavy design changes by simulating the forces that a booster will encounter during flight. The tank has previously passed three structural stress tests, but it appears that SpaceX wants to test it once more, presumably till it fails to determine the maximum stress the structure can withstand. At the build site, an aerial warp platform was installed inside the wide bay on August 23rd. More such platforms are lying at the production yard waiting to be installed. The platforms will make it easier for the SpaceX teams to work on the Starship and Super Heavy prototypes inside the wide bay. The exterior works of the Star Factory are rapidly progressing. Installation of the wall panels and rolling doors is nearing completion. At Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A, teams installed the seventh section of the orbital launch tower atop the sixth section on August 26. The Starship launch tower now stands taller than the Falcon 9 launch tower at Pad 39A. 
The short eighth section and the ninth and final roof section of the tower are currently being prefabricated at Roberts Road. Near the orbital launch tower, teams are now installing the bottom portion of what is expected to be a new cryogenic storage tank. More sections of the tank are lying at the site. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.